Welcome to this special live interview that is part of our Her Heart, Her History campaign, which honors both Black History Month and Heart Month. Uh, this campaign raises awareness about heart disease among Black women and pays tribute to the courageous Black women who have contributed to improving the health of women with heart disease. Throughout the month, we have showcased the stories of remarkable champions who have shared their heart journeys with us. As we highlight these stories, we also seek to address and explore the disparities and challenges faced by Black women in accessing health care and managing heart health. Um, today, we have the privilege of speaking with Dr. Rachel Bond. Dr. Bond is a board certified cardiologist who has dedicated her career to the treatment of heart disease through early detection, education, and prevention. She serves as the system director for women's heart health at Dignity Health in Chandler, Arizona. She's a valued member of the Women, Women Heart Scientific Advisory Council. Um, and she's also a recipient of the 2022 Wenger Award for Excellence in Medical Advocacy. We're so grateful to have you here, Dr. Bond. You know, your commitment to health equity, reducing disparities and fostering the professional growth of women and minorities in the health sciences field is truly, truly inspiring. So um, we know that disparities um, are rampant when it comes to heart health among black women. Could you tell us a little bit about these disparities and how they affect health outcomes and access to care compared to other groups? Uh, yes, first of all, I wanna thank you, Selena, for the opportunity. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. It's also always a pleasure to highlight the amazing work that Women Heart is doing in terms of advocacy and really just patient education. I think that's a really pertinent question because when we look at the statistics right now, we know that yes, women as a whole are dying earlier and earlier from heart disease, but when you actually look at it from a race and ethnicity perspective, black women are dying at younger and younger ages. Mm -hmm. And the reasons behind that I would say are multifold. Um, if we look at the common risk factors for heart disease, like high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, high cholesterol, we know that they're disproportionately affecting black women, even black children. There is an epidemic out there, obesity epidemic, um, which then leads to high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol in childhood. And we know that oftentimes black women are first black girls. So a lot of this that translates and what impacts them during their childhood, unfortunately translates to these poor outcomes later on in life. The other reason we see that there are higher and higher rates, unfortunately, of not just heart disease, but death from heart disease in black women is because when they do present to the hospital, oftentimes their, their symptoms are dismissed. And even when they're diagnosed with cardiac conditions, they're not receiving the same guideline recommendations. So that includes medications, sometimes even life-saving procedures. And this has I would say the biggest the biggest role when it comes to the disparities that we see, and a lot of that has to do with the unconscious biases and those implicit biases that are still rooted in the healthcare system. Wow. Can you explain, Dr. Bond, um, some of the unique risk factors or challenges perhaps? I mean, you, you started to describe some of them that, that Black women face when it comes to heart disease. And I know that you do a lot of work specifically in pregnant women, um, pregnant people who are, um, you know, who face cardiovascular challenges as well. So I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that. Absolutely. Um, I do want to highlight the fact I was so honored to be part of a scientific statement for the American Heart Association that was released in May of 2023 and circulation. And that statement highlighted a lot of these risk factors and how they do disproportionately affect women of color, particularly black women. Um, within that statement, we talked a lot about the fact that women of color, particularly black women above the age of 20, nearly 60% have some form of heart disease. And when you look at the actual risk factors, we see that the probably the most common is high blood pressure. And it's not to say that the blood pressure upon diagnosis is all that we really need to achieve. It's the fact that even when they're diagnosed, they're being undertreated. 
So -hmm. this goes back to those disparities of care. But then we have to factor in more of the unique risk factors. You brought up a really common one, which is pregnancy. Mm -hmm. If a woman or birthing person decides to have a child, their risk is slightly higher. And the risk is higher because that puts them at a slightly higher risk of preeclampsia, Mm -hmm. where their blood pressure could become severely elevated and they could have evidence of other organs that could be involved, like the heart, the brain, the, the liver. Um, other um, adverse pregnancy outcomes like gestational diabetes or other types of blood pressure issues during pregnancy or even premature labor, those are risk factors that could occur during the pregnancy, but they could impact a woman's health up to 10, 20 years later. And we know that those risk factors disproportionately affect women of color. And when we look specifically just at maternal health outcomes, but even cardiovascular outcomes, We know that the rooted reason behind these disparities are those psychosocial stressors. So the chronic stress that black women endure through the through the eyes of discrimination, misogyny, both coupled together really lead to that accelerated risk on their heart health, but also even their cognition, their ability to remember. Um, So we, we have to, I would say, as healthcare professionals and clinicians, Anytime we're seeing a patient factor in those stressors and those lived experiences that unfortunately are actually leading to these higher outcomes that we're seeing. And we absolutely need to do a better job in acknowledging them, but also figuring out how we could best mitigate them too. Dr. Brown, um, you alluded to uh, that the fact that we're talking about heart disease in the context of healthcare, but so many of the factors that contribute to this that you've already mentioned um, are out, far outside of the healthcare system, socioeconomic status, education, systemic racism, et cetera. Um, in addition to uh, what you've just said, how, how can we sort of, as, as a patient advocacy community, think about the connection between those factors and the higher rates of heart disease in Black women? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. And I I do believe that the work like organizations like Women Heart, um, as well as I want to highlight the Association of Black Cardiologists and the advocacy work that they have provided. Um, The ABC, for those that don't know, is a nonprofit organization. It was created in the 1970s by, by Black physicians. The goal at the time was to really hone in and focus on the disparities as it pertains to the Black and Brown community. I'm very fortunate because I volunteer my time with the ABC where I'm on the board of directors and I'm the co-chair of the Cardiovascular Disease and Women and Children Committee. And advocacy for us at the ABC, just like at Women Heart and just like other cardiovascular societies, I would say is at the forefront because that's where we know we're going to make the most achievements and changing these outcomes. Mm -hmm. From an advocacy perspective, we have to start at the level of changing healthcare, making sure that people have access to health insurance. We know that data suggests that when we have interrupted healthcare, we're going to have poor outcomes. But it's not just having access to health insurance, it's actually having access to equitable health care as well. So this is where a lot of our review boards are looking at what we would call disaggregated data, meaning we're separating the data by race, ethnicity, by sex and gender. And if we're seeing that a select group of patients are not receiving the appropriate care, we're talking and hopefully legislating ways to improve that. I think one pertinent way that's going to help without a doubt is increasing the pipeline of the number of minorities and underrepresented minorities in a healthcare profession. I would say for myself as a black female cardiologist, I only make up 2% of the population as a whole. And we know that 13 to 16% of the population is black. So there's a clear disparity in that. And there's so much data that suggests that when you have a healthcare professional that you could identify with from a cultural perspective, outcomes are better. Just like when you have a more diverse workforce, outcomes are better. So I think for all the organizations out there, highlighting the importance of diversifying the field of cardiology, of internal medicine, of healthcare in general is probably gonna be the most substantial thing we can do to lead to better outcomes. 
Absolutely. I could not agree with you more. Certainly that's been my experience. Um, given given what all that we've just said, what advice would you have for Black women who might feel uncertain or, or timid about navigating this healthcare system and, or advocating for themselves regarding their heart health, given you know, the, the history that this healthcare system has had re relative to Black women? Absolutely. I think that's a really important question. And I would say that it's hard. Um, it's hard often when you're coming into a healthcare system that you know may have been designed to actually lead to these ongoing disparities. But, and I say that very emphasis wise, a big, mm -hmm. big but, mm -hmm. is that there are people out there who are willing to actually make the changes that are necessary to ensure that outcomes are better. If you feel that you don't have a relationship with your healthcare team, where you trust your healthcare team, where you feel like you're being listened to by your healthcare team, and not just listened to, but also believed by your healthcare team, I am encouraging you out there to find another healthcare professional. I always explain to patients that if you feel that you're, all of your questions are not being answered, you absolutely have the right to ask for a second opinion a third opinion, a fourth opinion, at least the opportunity to voice the concerns that you have. That way you make sure you understand why the condition is what it is, and more importantly, how to best manage your own underlying cardiac condition. The good thing about heart disease is that it's preventable 80% of the time, but we won't be able to prevent it unless you know what your risk factors are. And more importantly, how to best improve those risk factors. And if you don't have a healthcare professional that's giving you the time to actually dissect what your risks are and why certain man managements uh, would be suggested, then I implore you to find someone who actually will. Look, I, as I mentioned, Dr. Bond, that has certainly been my experience of going through several cardiologists to get to the one that finally, you know, worked at, in partnership with me. Um, so I, I take that advice really to heart. So given, the historical context of medical mistrust in the black community and sort of you know the history that is not all that great what steps would you say healthcare providers can take to rebuild the trust um, to have the relationships that are partnerships with patients um, and then in that context how can black women advocate for their own health needs Absolutely. I will say that a lot because of the fact that we have seen these disparities in care, um, I would say largely the COVID-19 pandemic at the peak of the pandemic really magnifying these disparities. A lot of healthcare institutions actually honed in on that historical context. We as healthcare professionals, physicians and clinicians will not be able to, I would say, impactfully care for our patients unless we know the history behind why healthcare still to this day is how it is. A lot of that includes um, even going as far back as understanding slavery and the times of slavery as it pertains to the black community. And then even fast forwarding to sort of the post emancipation era and then the civil rights movement and factoring in all of that, including redlining and you know areas of limitations for communities in terms of housing and the ability to like safely exercise in neighborhoods. So factoring in all of those and understanding the history behind that without a doubt is something that we as physicians, clinicians, and healthcare professionals have to do in order to improve these outcomes in our patients. One way to achieve that, many health organizations have formulated individual diversity, equity, and inclusion committees. And through those committees, a lot of education is being um, provided. I will say that even for our cardiology fellowships, we are revamping our education. Mm -hmm. And that's through all of the cardiovascular societies acknowledging that the social determinants of health, the areas of where you were born, where you grew up, where you were raised and where you work and play and pray, that actually leads to 80% of our health outcomes. And it would be impossible for us to not better understand how to actually screen for that in our patients. In the past we weren't, but now we are encouraging that cardiology fellowships and residency programs and medical schools and nursing schools are talking about the importance of screening for those social determinants of health and factoring them into our patients' uh, decision-making and even their care management. And I think just that minor thing will probably make a, a significant difference in terms of how we best treat our patients. 
Um, in terms of the second question that you asked, how can Black women in particular best advocate for themselves? Mm -hmm. I would say, as I repeated before, finding that trusted healthcare team is going to be the most important uh, factor. You may also want to consider bringing in someone to each office visit um, who mm -hmm. could be your eyes and your ears. I think that there's a lot of value in having either a trusted family member or friend or even a trusted member of your community come in, be there to ask the questions that you may not feel comfortable asking, and more importantly, give you a different view of your own condition. The other thing that I would suggest also is coming to your healthcare appointments well prepared with a series of questions. Just like, you know, tax uh, um, t t time of year is coming up, we go yeah, to our yeah. accountants, we come prepared um, with all of the questions that we have. I encourage everyone when you go to your healthcare team and your doctors and your clinicians, you're doing the same. You come in with reports, you come in with questions because understanding your own health is going to lead to better outcomes in the future. Absolutely. Write it down. I mean, that's that's what I always say. Write it down. I cannot keep all my questions in my head and expect to, to remember them when, you know, when I do uh, when it comes time to see my doctor, um, Dr. Bond, are there any on on that point? Are there any specific lifestyle um, changes or preventive measures that um, Black women should consider prioritizing when it comes to their heart health? Uh, there are several, and I do want to highlight the fact that why heart disease is eighty percent preventable is because risk factors that are modifiable, meaning things we can change, are leading to it. So mm -hmm. elevated blood pressure and cholesterol and blood sugar, obesity or overweight, and maybe not exercising and eating healthy. So we are recommending and encouraging that you speak to your healthcare professional about what does look like an ideal diet for me from a nutritional perspective. We know that usually removing a high abundance of saturated fat, which usually comes from fried foods, red meat, processed foods, and improving actually the healthy fats, which oftentimes called omega-3, come from salmon, so the oily fish as an example. But we also know that exercise is a key factor, and that exercise that usually is suggested is 150 minutes per week of some form of moderate cardio. I like to tell my patients that that does include walking, right? It's just at a little bit of a brisk pace. So we have the opportunity to incorporate these little minor, little minor things in our day to day, even at work. If we have access to stairs, use the stairs instead of the elevator. If we live in an urban environment and we use the subway system to get to work, perhaps get off at a stop before your house, that way it forces you to walk a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. So these are things that I would highly encourage. And then the last thing, particularly as it pertains to black women that I would encourage includes stress. Mm -hmm. Understanding those psychosocial stressors and being aware of them, but also figuring out healthy ways to cope with that stress because that's the most important thing. Everyone has stress. Yes, there are certain populations that have a higher abundance because of our lived experiences, but figuring out with your physician and clinician the best healthy way to cope with that stress is going to lead to better outcomes as well. I love that you put all of that together, this idea that there is stress and then there's ex ex an extraordinary amount of stress for certain communities because of their lived experience. I, you know, That's going to stick in my in my mind for a long time. Um, we're coming to the end of our session, Dr. Bond. Do you have any final thoughts or any sort of quick words of wisdom that you want to leave our audience with today? Absolutely. So as mentioned, heart disease is our greatest threat, but it is largely preventable. One area that I didn't highlight that is so, so important is family history. And we know that the reason heart disease is not 100% preventable is because of genetics. This is an opportunity for us to learn a little bit more about our family history. It's also an opportunity for women out there to know what their risk factor is and if they have children, encourage them to understand those risks as well. I believe I would say that this is best highlighted even when it comes to maternal health, because for mothers who have had preeclampsia, it actually impacts their children in their childhood. Mothers who have had preeclampsia, their children are more at risk of obesity, more at risk of high blood pressure and future cardiovascular disease. 
So for us in the realm of cardiology, we're really thinking about these risk factors from a generational health perspective. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. absolutely know your family history, know your risk factors, and more importantly, make sure that your children and your first degree relatives, like your siblings and your parents are aware of your risk factors as well. Absolutely. Essentially having that be a normal conversation at the dinner table. That's exactly. exactly. Sounds like you're suggesting. Exactly. Yeah. Well, Dr. Bond, I would like to thank you so much for joining us today and really for your unwavering dedication to advocating for women's heart health. We, we love working with you at Women Heart um, and couldn't be more pleased to have you join us today. Um, I'm Selena Gore with Women Heart. This marks the end of our um, interview. It marks the end of our campaign. Um, to everyone tuning in, we invite you to explore our social media platforms to catch up on previous interviews with Women Heart Champions throughout February. Um, additionally, you can also visit our website at womenheart.org backslash herheart to delve deeper into this campaign and to access more information and resources. Um, and I just invite you to have a wonderful afternoon. And again, thank you, Dr. Bond. Thank you.